So today we're going to cover classical conditioning, and it's going to build on some of the behavioral and biological mechanisms that we talked about last week when we reviewed habituation, sensitization, and perceptual learning. So the first part of this lecture, like all lectures, is going to focus on the psychology, the behavioral processes. And does anybody know who that is? Quick, OK. That's Phil Zimbardo from Stanford, who uh, is most famous or infamous for the Stanford Prison Experiment, a study of conformity in undergraduates at Stanford that's uh, one, of the many, one of the many studies that led to uh, enhanced IRB review of psychological studies. Behavioral psychologists have come up with new views, not only of animal behavior, but of human nature as well. And these views all concern a process that we take for granted, learning, because we are all truly born to learn. Ironically, one of the most important figures in the study of learning, Ivan Pavlov, wasn't concerned with the subject at all, at least not at first. Pavlov, a noted Russian scientist, won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly, an inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testing, a strange thing happened. The dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistant, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic, unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response so by itself is introduced an hour of just before the presentation of the original stimulus. If the neutral or signaling stimulus is presented alone and response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others study the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work and the work of those who followed him led to a remarkable conclusion. And that is, any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight, or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of relax, just saying the word relax is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction. That, by the, way, this, by the way, is Jordan Hall, the psychology department at Stanford, a beautiful place. So that sort of reviews some of the basic uh, concepts, a little bit of the history. Um, so to summarize, the unconditioned stimulus, or the US, uh, naturally evokes some response called the unconditioned response. Uh, 
Um, now you might wonder, why is it called unconditioned response? Because in fact, what this response is, is an unconditional response. It happens unconditionally without conditions. Um, and in fact, the original Russian really is unconditional. And it was mistranslated as unconditioned 70 or 80 years ago. And that mistranslation has continued to become now the accepted uh, English terminology, although it doesn't actually make sense. Uh, conditioned stimulus is what's trained, that's the tone. A cue that's paired with the US and eventually elicits the anticipatory response, the conditioned response. So the C's, the conditioned stimulus, the conditioned response are part of the learning system. The U, the unconditioned or unconditional stimulus and response are what's the innate reaction. So in this last example with Phil Zimbardo and the gun, let's just go through. What was the unconditioned stimulus? Anyone? What was the unconditioned stimulus? What's the stimulus that evokes some response? Right, OK. And what's the unconditioned response to a gunshot? Right, OK. You don't have to be trained that. You do that even to a small baby. You know, if you were, if you were as, as uh, unethical as Watson and like little Albert, if you went and started shooting off little guns at babies, they would, start, they would make the same thing. They don't need to be trained to that. So what's the conditioned stimulus? Right, saying relax. Okay, and then the conditioned response. Right, the conditioned response is the startle, but now it's the startle to the saying relax. Okay, so let's go talk about classical conditioning. It begins with an innate or a learned reflex. Then there's an unconditioned stimulus, such as food, an unconditioned response called the UR, such as salivation. A neutral stimulus is presented before the reflex is triggered, producing a new reflex, um, the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response. Which is it. So again, we'll go through this again. There's the innate reflex, which we saw in the movie. OK, food makes the dog salivate with training. The bell is paired with the food, which makes the dog salivate. And eventually, the bell alone is sufficient to make the dog salivate. Okay? So we'll see this over and over again. And if this is the, this particularly classical conditioning, you'll see later on in the lecture, is really the fundamental building block for a lot of what we know about the neurobiology of learning. So, I've done this. So, there are many varieties of classical conditioning. So, what ones have we seen so far? In today, this morning? What? We saw louder? We saw the dog and, and the gunshot. Okay? So, uh, through across all, all species, one can, one can find classical conditioning. Some types of, of ways of studying classical conditioning can be done in many different species. Um, in other cases, there are some that are more appropriate to one species or another. So there are a couple of standards that have become uh, sort of the canonical ones used in the lab. And we can, de we can uh, define them, we can categorize them in terms of two types. Aversive conditioning, that's when the US is unpleasant, and therefore the conditioned response is some anticipation or avoidance which uh, allows the animal to better cope with something unpleasant. So an electric shock, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is how one can condition flies. Flies don't like electric shock. An air puff to the eye or eye blink conditioning, which is one of those paradigms which is especially common throughout mammalian. Appetitive conditioning is when the US is pleasant. And so the condition response is something which is, is allows the person or animal to better take advantage of this Appetitive, pleasant stimulus. Food, in which the dog salivates in order to better prepare for it. Or sex. Sex can be a, a very powerful, unconditioned stimulus. Okay? And uh, there are various ways in which an animal or person can show anticipatory behavior when they expect to get sex. So let's talk about sex in quails. Um, so this is a quail. And the way that the conditioning is done is the CS is a light. Okay. The US is a door, and behind the door is a, uh, a female who is in heat and sexually receptive. And uh, so exposure to the female, the female is the US, okay, produces arousal. So sexual arousal is the natural response. The CS is a tone or a light, which is initially neutral. But after pairing the CS, the light, okay, with the female, the CS comes to produce this approach behavior. So that every time the light comes on, the quail will come, will sort of begin to anticipate this female, to anticipate sort of sexual contact with the female and approach the door. So this is a form of appetitive conditioning because the animal is sort of preparing for something 
that it wants. Odor conditioning is an example of aversive conditioning. And the way it starts is you have a tube, okay, and uh, is this the right way? Um, and you start by having two different parts of the tube, two different parts of the tube. And when the, uh, the flies are in one part of the tube, they get shocked. And the other part of the tube, they don't. Okay, so exposure to shock produces an escape avoidance behavior. And the CS is an odor. I'm sorry, the CS is an odor initially neutral. I, I, I described this wrong. So when, when there's an odor in, in the tube, the, 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 the animals get shocked. Okay, so they're, they're sometimes there's no odor and there's no shock. Sometimes there is an odor and the, rats, the, the flies do get shocked. Then you put, in the second pass, you put the flies in a larger container in the middle, and there's the odor on one side and no odor on the other, and the flies all go to the non-odor side. Okay, so they've learned to avoid a CS, namely an odor, which has been paired with an aversive US or a shock. Okay, and one of the characteristics of aversive conditioning is it's very rapid. Many forms of aversive conditioning can take place in just one or two trials, while many forms of repetitive conditioning often take longer. So we're, we're wired in some ways to learn faster about potentially aversive cues. Okay, and it helps one avoid this noxious stimulus. Eye blink conditioning is another form of aversive conditioning. It involves an avoidance response, and it's particularly been uh, used because one can do essentially the same type of learning um, in all mammals. Um, in particular, rabbits are a very popular preparation because rabbits um, will allow themselves to be restrained in a plexiglass container um, so that they can be set up with the apparatus. Rats and a lot of other rodents will get stressed out if they're put in this and they'll hold the stress will alter whatever it is you're trying to study. So, um, and people will do it like this. So the basic idea is that a CS is a tone or a light which comes to produce an eye closure, the conditioned response. It's a form of aversive conditioning because the eye closure comes to be timed just prior to the anticipation of the air puff. So the air puff is not painful, but it's aversive. Okay? And what you learn to do if you have a tone and then an air puff is blink so that your eye is closed when the air puff comes. So let me show you what it looks like in humans. Okay, as you can see, Howard has got a, a straw pointing at his eye, and uh, via this a long set of straws that are taped together, comes to a blue bulb on my desk over here. And if I squeeze the bulb, Howard has to blink. And I guess let's go to our split screen here. Uh, because the air is puffing into, uh, into his eye. And we've got him turned in such a way that um, uh, he can't... Uh, see the, the blue ball. Now, from classical conditioning, we could uh, expect that since what we have here is a, is a reflex, that whenever the air puffs, that, uh, that he should blink, right? Really has no choice over that. But let's suppose, and this may take more coordination than I have. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Jerry Ford, President Ford, trying to walk and chew gum at the same time? And I'm going to try and use a, a pencil tap here and pair that with uh, the, uh, the puff of air enough times, and then uh, let's eventually see what, uh, what happens. trial conditioning for sure here. <laughs> So if that was a proposal for how to do eye blink conditioning, how, how might you critique this as an experimental method? In a, and a, any any, any uh, concerns about how this experiment is being conducted? Many. What? Many? So tell me, what are some of your concerns methodologically? If you know, like, I mean, like 
Oh, yeah. so, so he's sort of very aware, might be aware of what's going on if he's listening to the thing. Any other, cons any other? The timing between each uh, knock and knock. Right, it's, it's completely done by sort of guess. You know, it's, it's very random. But it's also, it also lacks um, variability in e timing. Exactly. Right, exactly. So between, so, so, so the problems with the timing both in the intratrial interval, which is the time from going like to the air puff, but there's also, he was doing it air puff. So eventually you could almost get into a rhythm. So in, in, a, uh, in an actual laboratory version of human eye blink conditioning, which is something we've done here in the past, um, the, uh, first of all, it's all controlled by computers, and there's a, a fixed time exactly between the tone and the air puff, um, but also the time between trials, the intertrial interval, varies from trial to trial, so you can't build up an expectation simply based on how long it's been since the last trial. Um, the other thing that's usually done is um, you're playing, a, usually often a silent movie or something, so a person's attention is distracted, okay, so that they're not sort of focusing on listening to this and consciously trying to be aware of it. So anyway, a good, a good exercise both in seeing a very crude way of doing eye blink conditioning and to illustrate some of the things you don't want to do if you actually do an experiment like this. So in rabbits, which is where a lot of the work has been done, um, we see before training there's a tone, has no effect. After training the tone is paired with an air puff and then the rabbit blinks, okay? And uh, the CS builds gradually. It's not like this one trial fear conditioning. Um, and uh, it's not exactly the same as the CS. You know, in some cases the CS is exactly the same. In this case, it's an anticipatory eye blink because when you play the air puff, the animal will still blink. But what you're getting from the tone is an anticipation of it. You're sort of beginning to close the eye in advance. And we can see that, let's see, is there, I hope there's a better, well, maybe later on. Um, so in one case, it's in terms of both, you know, we saw very little conditioning going on in that movie, but in both rabbit and humans, you see this sort of gradual learning curve. So it's by no means one trial. And this is graphing um, sort of the percent of trials on which you get a conditioned response. So it looks like it's much faster in humans than in rabbits. Is that accurate? Well, the, the learning? Um, it all depends really on how they're spaced. Right. So you could do, um, so this gets back to remember this of mast versus, mm -hmm. um, it turns out that if you, in this kind of conditioning, it's sort of the opposite. If you do a whole bunch of trials right away um, in one block, um, it can take many, many trials to get it. If you do one trial a day, you can learn it in four or five trials. Um, but of course, it'll take you five days to do it. So it's the question is whether it's the rabbit's time or your time that you're really trying to optimize. Um, so a typical way that the data is graphed is percent of CRs. So you have to have some measure of saying there was a blink or not. Okay, so you have to have some criteria for blink. Um, and initially, you don't see any conditioned response. And over time, nearly, at least especially in the rabbits, every trial produces a response. So this is what I mentioned, that the CR and the UR are similar. They're both eye blinks, but they're not identical. So on day one, you have, this is the CS and the, and the, uh, the US. This is just a standard reflex. This is like jumping to the sound of a gunshot. Um, what happens here is that over days, there starts to be a stronger and stronger response that builds in anticipation, because that's what's adaptive. And moreover, it builds so that the peak closure is t well timed. So one of the characteristics of this, this type of conditioning is it's not just a response that's described at a trial level, namely you did or you didn't respond, but it's a response that has a very important temporal characteristic. And it shows that the animal has not only learned that the air puff predicts the eye, but the air puff predicts I'm sorry, the tone predicts the air puff, but the tone predicts that the air puff will happen at 500 milliseconds. So you'll see incredibly precise timing, okay? Um, if I told you the air puff will come 500 milliseconds after the tone, do you think you'd be able to blink exactly at 500 milliseconds? Okay, so very, very hard to consciously know what 500 milliseconds are and blink. Uh, and yet, humans and rabbits are able to do it, and one of the things we'll see later in the lecture is that the ways that they're able to do it is because they're not thinking about it, that there are other structures beyond the sort of higher cortical conscious processing that actually are able to learn to do something precisely for 500 milliseconds. So this is a conditioned compensatory response. So I'm sorry. So another type of response, so the eye blink is similar. The, CF, the CR is similar to the UR. It's just moved in, in advance in time, okay? 
what's another example of an, a response, an appetitive response, where the CR is the same as the UR, only shifted in time? Exactly. So what, what the dogs are doing, um, so that's an appetitive paradigm. This is an aversive, eye blink conditioning is an aversive, I'll go back to that, it's an aversive paradigm. But in both cases, it's advent, the prediction, tone, you know, you know, bell predicts food or tone predicts, predicts air puff. In both cases, the prediction allows you to prepare, okay? And that's adaptive, either for the food, because it, you get all ready to eat it right away. You know, you've got the salivation, your, your, your mouth is all wet, ready to, your stomach is all ready to digest it. In this case, you're prepared to avoid it. So whether you're preparing to consume it or preparing to avoid it, it's to your advantage to know in advance what's going to happen. So, but in both cases, the form and, and the, the, the general response is the same. It's just changed the temporal characteristics. There's another type of, of responding, which is called a compensatory response, where the CR is in many ways the opposite of the UR. So content, compensatory, well, I have to say it, compensatory response is the opposite, and it helps to balance or correct what the UR will do. So for example, if you inject adrenaline, okay, which is the US, you get a heart rate increase. Okay? If, I give, if I put adrenaline, Muhammad, he's the MD, if he puts adrenaline in your heart, your heart will start racing. Okay? That's why they do it often. When do they do, when do, they do that clinically? When someone has an overdose or a heart attack? When, uh, when, no, or a heart stops? When, do you, heart stops. when the heart stops, for whatever reason, um, you'll put in adrenaline to get it going. So if you, repeat, if you keep giving someone adrenaline, okay, um, in a particular context, say a testing chamber, then eventually, if you put people in that testing chamber, it will decrease their heart rate. Because the body is trying to maintain homeostasis, a balance. It doesn't want to have an excessive heart rate, okay? So one way to calm your heart is to put, put, be in a situ is to put yourself in a room where you get this accelerated, um, where you, you're getting this accelerated heart rate because you're sort of preparing for the adrenaline, okay? So one way of thinking about this is tolerance, okay? In the t if, you, if you put the uh, person in the chamber where they're used to getting a CR, it will weaken the overall effects of the drug. So it looks as if, so if I bring you into this room, and the first day I give you the adrenaline, okay, and you get this big heart rate response, if I bring you into that room day after day, you'll start to see a tolerance. You'll see less and less of a response. And the reason you're seeing less and less of a response isn't so much that the drug has lost its efficacy, but that you have developed this con Pavlovian condition compensatory response that lowers your heart rate in anticipation of that. Okay? So this, res this compensatory response, condition compensatory response, is a big part of what happens in drug tolerance, in addiction, and in treatment. Okay? So one of the, when we think in drug, in drug condition, in, in, in drug addiction, uh, one of the, the tenets of Alcoholics Anonymous or Drug Addiction Anonymous is you're supposed to avoid the places and people that you used to associate with when you were doing drugs. And the reason is that, among, among the reasons, is that these people and places become conditioned stimuli to develop the anticipation. So if there's, you know, if you always get together with Joe um, and get high, then the very act of seeing Joe will get you sort of, uh, you know, uh, begin to crave the drug. And that craving of the drug is actually your body compens compensating for the anticipation of the drug. So it's sort of, re it's sort of getting you, so the craving, you think of the craving as the opposite of a high. You know, you're high, um, your craving is this desire for the high, then what that craving really is, is is the biological compensation for sort of going in the opposite direction physiologically so that when you get the drug, you come back. That's also why you get drug tolerance, okay? People, people take drugs and they very often need more and more and more, okay? And one of the pro problems is that people often don't realize that their, that their tolerance, their need for larger and larger quantities to get the same amount of high is actually very contextually sensitive. So you'll very often hear stories, or used to hear stories about, you know, so-and-so rock star died of a drug overdose in a hotel room. You know, so very often, if you look at these stories that would appear in the news, it would be so-and-so died in a hotel room of a drug overdose. And one interpretation is that, you know, they were used to taking these drugs in a, in a, in a situation where, you know, there was so much sort of anticipation from the context and the paraphernalia that their body was prepared for a particular high dose that they were used to. And they go to a hotel room and, 
um, they get, you know, and they don't have that compensatory response, and so their body overdoses. Okay? You can also get overdoses often when people take um, drugs in an unusual way. So for example, lots of drug addicts, heroin addicts, have trouble finding a vein after a long time. So there have been cases where they will act, a man will actually inject into his penis where there's a more accessible vein and often die of an overdose because part of their whole anticipation of the drug is rolling up their sleeves and finding the vein and so forth. So all of that builds the compensation that allows them to tolerate the high dose. They take it in a novel way, in a novel part of their body, and they sort of lack some of that conditioned response which allows them to tolerate the high dose. So a lot of interest in conditioning in the context of drug addiction. So let's just review. There are a number of widely used paradigms. We can think of them in terms of appetitive conditioning and aversive conditioning. The Pavlovian dog response is sort of the classic one. The quail sex we describe, these are both appetitive. Aversive conditioning, the fly shock. The conditioned emotional response, that's Phil Zimbardo and his gun in, at Stanford. And the eye blink conditioning, which has been a preferred method because it can be done in a variety of mammals from humans to rabbits. Extinction is what happens when you essentially reverse the process. We, we acquire a response, and then we keep presenting the tone alone. So imagine Phil Zimbardo, after going relax, bang, relax, bang, sort of stands out there and says, relax. Nothing happens. Relax. Relax. And eventually, you begin to sort of learn that the relax no longer predicts the gunshot, and you begin to actually relax, or at least not startle. So this is the extinction. Okay. Now it looks like eventually the extinction has gone away, like you've unlearned it. So an, an, the initial thinking about extinction was that it was unlearning. It was like whatever weights were, were going up here have disappeared. Now the problem is it's, it's not likely to be just unlearning, because if after you extinguish this whole thing, you know, relax, relax, okay. If then Phil said, relax, and then he shot the gun again, you would very quickly start responding to the relax. So the idea is that it hasn't gone away during extinction, but it's been masked. Okay? So again, extinction doesn't erase the CSUS connection. It inhibits it. Stress, a new context, the passage of time. So again, if you came out the next day after Phil had, had extinguished you and then said relax, you might start a little bit again. Okay? This suggests that the conditioned memory survives extinction, and there's a lot of interest in understanding how is it that you can behaviorally not see the response here, and yet various manipulations, stress, context changes, or time can cause the reinstatement? So to summarize, classical conditioning starts with an innate reflex. The unconditioned stimulus produces an unconditioned response, or as Pavlov originally intended, an unconditional response. The neutral stimulus is repeatedly presented before the reflex is triggered. This builds over time a new reflex that the organism allows it to prepare and anticipate the innate reflex. This is the condition stimulus leading to the condition response. We've described some standard approaches. Classical conditioning usually builds gradually, although in the cases of aversive conditioning it can happen quite rapidly. Um, they're not always the same. They can be similar um, or they can be an opponent processes. And extinction occurs when you see the CS alone in the absence of a US. So that's the basic principles. So you remember baby Albert? Okay, someone want to summarize? Someone you want to tell us what was the baby Albert study? Right, okay, so Donald, so what's the US UR reflex in this scenario? Right, and what's the CSCR reflex? Yes, sir? Right, so the rat's initially the neutral stimulus and startles. So what changes during learning? What changes during training? Right, so an association is formed between the rat and the startling aversive stimulus. Now, we've talked about that the, this baby Albert had a lot of uh, ethical issues, like you know, whatever happened to baby Albert? Did he go up to become a, you know, fearful of the outdoors. So let's say we had done this study, and now we wanted to uh, uh, treat baby Albert. Now we wanted to treat baby Albert um, and get rid of his fear of rats. Okay, how might you do that? What, what, what's, what conditioning paradigm 
do you want to draw on to treat this anxiety disorder? Medication. Right. So how would you do that? What, what, would a, what would an anxiety treatment for baby Albert be? You could associate seeing a rat with something pleasant, like a flower or an image of his mother. That would be great. So not only are you extinguishing, but you're creating an alternative association, even better than just extinguishing it. Okay. Great. Okay. So classical conditioning seems to offer a very straightforward ruling. It seems like it's just you pair them, the CS and the US, and they're associated. Okay? For a long time, that's what people thought, okay? that it was just a question of association. But we now know that it's actually much more complex and subtle. Okay? There are issues of timing, blocking, latent inhibition, and associative bias. I'm going to talk about all of these now. Okay? So I mentioned before that that in the eye blink conditioning, people and rabbits are able to do something that we couldn't do consciously if we tried, which is to time their response to be exactly the same as the intratrial interval. So there are two ways in which you can do that. So we have an intratrial interval from the start of the CS to the US, and there are two ways you can have it. One is, if the CS is a tone, the tone stays on during the entire trial, and then at the end, there's the air puff. And the other is the tone is just a beep, and then there's a delay, and then there's uh, the US. Now, the complex thing is for reasons that I never really understood. The paradigm where there's a delay between the t is called trace conditioning, and the paradigm where there isn't a delay is called delay. But the idea is that somehow there must be a trace here. Okay? So these produce very different types of conditioning. Um, trace conditioning, the optimal interstimulus interval with less learning, you need less, less of a, um, the optimal interval is less. You, you learn fastest when it's closer, so it's sort of harder. Um, and you can, in fact, also try to do backwards conditioning, where you have the US and then the CS, and you'll find that, in general, there's no learning. So there's a, there's a whole issue of the ways in which the temporal relationship between the CS and the US, and whether or not the CS stays on, or whether it comes on, or whether it's just a sort of a punctate onset so there are many variables that can be manipulated, and they affect the rate of learning, the amount of learning, and these are variables which come to play later in the neuroscience of conditioning. So blocking is a really, really important behavioral phenomenon. Okay, and uh, let me just see what we have here. So in blocking, I'll, first I'll explain the paradigm. Actually, let me let me explain it through a metaphor. Um, so imagine that uh, I'm looking to predict the stock market. Okay. And I'm looking for advice, and Sue's kind of savvy. She has a career in business. So I start to ask Sue for uh, advice on stocks. And every week, Sue says, you know, buy AT&T, uh, buy IBM, so on and so forth. And eventually, uh, I start you know, giving Sue a stipend. I, I pay her you know, a little bit of money every week, and she gives me a stock tip, and I use the investments. I do that in a while, and I'm, I'm doing really well. And uh, it's costing me 10 bucks a week, but overall, I'm doing well. After about a month or two of this, Mohammed comes by and says, Mark, I've got this great idea scheme okay, to beat the stock market. And he says, he says, give me 10 bucks a week, and I'll start giving you tips. But his tips are the same as the ones that Sue has. So should I pay him another $10 in addition to the $10 that I'm paying for Sue? Why not? Why should I, why should I say no to Mohammed? It's the same. Right. So he, uh, Mohammed is not providing me any value Okay? He's not providing me any, any value that allows me to predict. So here, I'm not trying to predict food, or I'm not trying to predict water, I'm trying to predict the stock market. Okay? So I already have a, a valuable source of information, which is Sue. So Muhammad's information is redundant. Okay? Therefore, I'm not willing to pay him what he asks. Okay? So let me describe that. So what we can think about here is, so as a, an investor, I pay for information, but only if that information is valuable to me, relative to what I knew before. If I had never met Sue, okay, and I've been sitting along here and watching the stock market go up and other people make money and Mohammed came by and said, I've got these great picks and he shows me the advice and it turns to be good, then sure, I would pay Mohammed $10 a week for his advice. So it's not that Mohammed's advice is bad, it's that it's redundant with what I already have. Okay? So let's see what this looks like in the laboratory. We have a control group that where you train that a tone and light CS precedes the shock. So tone and light predicts the shock. And so what happens afterwards is the tone and light um, are uh, producing a modest conditioned response. Okay? 
Now we have another group, that's the control group, pre-trained group, where we start with the CS preceding the shock US. So the CS predicts the US. And then the tone and light CS training comes on. Okay? So who's the, who is Muhammad and Sue? Who's the tone and who's the light? Donald? Who's the tone and who's the light? Which is Sue? Uh, she would be the pre-trained. Right. So she's the... Okay, and Muhammad is the... Okay, so right here. So, so he... So, Sue was giving me information, the light. Okay, I learned it was valuable. Okay, then Muhammad came on and he was redundant. Okay, so in, in the investing metaphor, I'm going to continue to pay Sue, I'm not going to pay Muhammad. Okay, so afterwards, what we see is that, so in this case, we're not, our, our notion of payment or pay is really paying attention and responding. So, just like I continued to pay Sue for her advice. The, the light, the initial stimulus, gets a large conditioned response, and the tone produced none. Okay? And that's because the light, like Sue, provided useful information early on, such that by the time the tone came along, although it was also predictive, it was redundant, and I didn't pay any attention. So it suggests that, that animals in conditioning are not just accumulating all the relevant predictive associations, because you know, moving forward, Muhammad and Sue are both equally predictive of the stock market. But it suggests that I'm, I'm allocating scarce resources, and once I fixate on something that is useful, um, I'm conservative. I don't, there's no, I don't switch uh, my attention, my resources, unless it gains me something. Okay? Now, imagine what would happen if I was paying Sue $10 a week, and, and she was giving me good advice, and Muhammad came along, and he said, I have some advice. And he began to tell me stocks that were going to go up twice as much as the ones that Sue did. What should I do? Sure. Okay. So what's a, what's, what might be a similar situation in conditioning? What would be a similar situation in conditioning to Muhammad coming by with better stock advice? Uh, if, if the tone predicts a much larger shock. Right. Right. So it might be that the tone predicts a much larger shock. Or it could also be probabilistic. It could be that... that um, right here, we're describing this deterministically. It could be that the, you know, here the light predicts the shock. It's going to happen you know, with 70% accuracy. But the, the tone could predict it with 100% accuracy. So in either case, you're getting more predictive value. So anyway, there's the, there's the analogy. Different name, same concept. Okay. So the re why is this strange? You know, you know, when, when I start by describing it, in the metaphor of the stock analyst, it seems to make perfect sense. But it was strange because if you look here, the tone in both situations, the control group has no pre-training. So in the control group, it's as if Muhammad and the control group is the equivalent of Muhammad and Sue coming to me both at the same time, both with equivalent advice. Okay? And what might I do? I might randomly pick one of them, you know, so that on average the other, or I might give each of them five bucks. You know, and so I kind of split the difference. They're both coming to me with the same advice. So, but in either case, there would be no reason for me to prefer Muhammad's advice over Sue's. And so what happens is that in conditioning, if you have the tone and light, you get a medium conditioned response to both. While if you pre-train one, all of the responding goes to one, the pre-trained, and not to the other. And so the reason this was sort of interesting is that, or important is that uh, theories of learning up until about the 1960s, these experiments were done um, in the, sort of the late 1960s, these blocking studies by Kamen. Um, and they challenged the notion that animals are just accumulating associations. Okay, so who is it who talked about principles of association from the first lecture? Who, who is it who was sort of the first associative learning? What? Okay, and so what, what were his principles of association? Contiguity, timing, and co-occurrence, okay? So what you see is Aristotle would have been surprised by blocking. Because Aristotle would say, well, in both these cases, the tone, or Muhammad, is equally associated, equally contiguous you know, with the outcome, equally contiguous with the stock market changing. Therefore, the conditions in both of these cases, according to Aristotle, should be the same. So Aristotle would expect no difference in responding to the cues, to the tone in this case. But there is a big difference, OK? There's a blocking in this case. And that's why it's called blocking because 
the prior training to the queue, like Sue's prior expertise, experience, blocks paying attention to the later queue. Okay? So this was interesting because, although Aristotle was many hundreds and thousands of years ago, his basic ideas were the essence of a lot of the mathematical uh, theories of learning that were predominating up through the 1960s. And so studies like blocking challenged that. Okay. So this just summarizes. Both groups experience the same association. Prior experience blocks learning of the tone US association. This suggests that classical conditioning is about tracking information and particularly informational value during learning. And when the CS is redundant, no learning occurs. So it seems as if there must be something more than just these kinds of associative uh, tabulating of what's, going, what's, what's happened with what. Okay, Because Aristotle's view was a very simple mechanistic one. Whenever two things co-occur at the same time, in association and contiguity, we associate them. The blocking study showed that th what's going on is actually more subtle. Okay. Let me describe another paradigm which also challenges a bit this Aristotelian view of association. It's called latent inhibition. And here we have a control group in which in phase one the animal sits in a chamber and does nothing. And, and in phase one, in the experimental group, there's just the CS is occurring. Okay? So it's just the tone occurs, the tone occurs. Okay? Uh, and later on, what we see is the tone is paired with the air puff. So let me just ask, if we just look at phase one, what does is, what is this remind you of, the tone occurring over and over again? Extinction. Or, well, there's only extinction if there's learning. So right, this is very much like habituation. Except in habituation, there's a response. Okay? Habituation is I go, boo, and you're startled. I say boo over and over again. So in habituation, it's like you're habituating to the gunshot. You, you start with a response that startles you because it, it, it may appear to be potentially relevant. And eventually, you realize that it's not. Okay? So you see habituation. You can measure it as the response declining to something that you have a response to initially, like a, like a, start, like a, a gunshot of a blank. Okay? So in this case, it's similar in that it's just a, a, a cue appearing over and over again, but there's never any response. Okay? The, the tone doesn't begin as a startling response. It's sort of a neutral cue that you don't have any innate response to. Okay? Now, in phase two, the tone is paired with the US. Okay? And what happens is, let's see what goes on here, one second. Okay? So you pre-expose to the CS repeatedly, then you pair the CS with the US, and what you see is the following, is that the pre-exposed group learns much slower. Okay. So both groups got the same tone CS, tone air puff, CS US training. The only difference is that this group was pre-exposed to the tone. Okay. So the reason this was sort of a surprising finding is that of these associative learning theories suggested that nothing should be happening here. This is a cue that predicts nothing and nothing happens. Okay, so many of these theories suggest that the tone alone, if it's a neutral cue, there sh it, should have no no, it should have no relationship to the US to begin with. It never predicted the US. Therefore, having the tone alone does not cha shouldn't change that at all. And yet it clearly does. So this suggested that the simple notions of contiguity aren't enough to explain various phenomena. So latent inhibition, there's a variant of this called learned irrelevance that some of you are familiar with. Um, and uh, learned irrelevance is very similar to this, except that rather than the tone appearing alone, the tone in US appear here explicitly unpaired and uncorrelated. So a variant of latent inhibition is called learned irrelevance. We are explicitly training that the two cues do not co-occur. Not, one does not predict the other. So this was another blow to behaviorism, another suggestion that this simple, it's really was more of a blow to uh, uh, Aristotle and these ideas that you could explain everything by these simple contiguity of association. So the last uh, sort of wrinkle, now you remember that Phil Zimbardo in his introduction was, was, was waxing on about how classical conditioning allows you to pair any stimulus with any other stimulus. Okay? Um, so Imagine, so that, that's a very broad claim, 
okay? Any stimulus with any other stimulus. So imagine that you went to see an Adam Sandler movie and you had popcorn, okay? You've never had popcorn before, imagine, and you've never seen an Adam Sandler movie before, and that night you get a horrible stomach ache and you're throwing up. Now there are two neutral cues, Adam Sandler and the popcorn that you ate in the movie theater. Which one do you think you would be more likely to avoid in the future? Okay, why is that? What? Right. We, we have this sort of innate bias that, that these things that we taste and eat are more likely that they be the things that make us sick. Okay? So it's not quite the case that, that we could just as easily, I mean, it could be the case that I could rig up an experiment where every time you saw Adam Sandler, you know, I, I would, uh, you'd get sick, and eventually you might actually really begin to, you know, find Adam Sandler as nauseating as I actually happen to. But, um, but it would be harder to do that conditioning. It's much easier to condition someone to, the, to a taste, like the taste of popcorn or butter, okay? And that's what these garcia Coling studies did. They showed that a tone and a taste paired with poison, and then they, uh, in the shock group, they had tone and taste paired with shock, and what they found was that, let me just see here, what they found that some associations are innately easier, that it's easier that, it's easier that when you have a tone and taste poison, it's really only the taste that, that becomes to predict the poison. That's like the popcorn predicting the nausea. Um, but when the tone and taste are paired with the shock, um, it's the tone that we associate with the shock. Okay, so it suggests that it's not quite so equipotential in terms of CSs and USs. You know, we can potentially train many different ones that are arbitrary, but we come with some a priori biases that sounds are what are preparatory information for predicting shocks, and that tastes are preparatory information for what might be poisonous. Okay, so we have these innate preferences for forming associations that can override or interact with the statistical correlations that occur during learning. So let me turn now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so are there any questions? So what those things show you, the timing, the blocking late inhibition, all show that the rules for classical conditioning are quite complex, okay? And so researchers have turned to models of classical conditioning, formal models of rules for learning when it will occur. And the hope was that a simple model will begin to explain some of the mechanisms that occur during conditioning that would allow us both behaviorally to understand what's happening and to predict when certain situations will lead to conditioning and others won't. And in addition, they might suggest mechanisms to look for in the brain. So there have been two popular traditions in terms of models of conditioning. One is called a U.S. modulation approach, and it's where the learning changes processing of the U.S. Okay, so it says that during learning, something's happening to the unconditioned stimulus. And C.S. modulation approaches, which are attentional, which says that something during learning affects the attention. Okay, 